This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. And welcome in, folks, to another edition of Open Mic Night. I'm your host, Noah Taluki. And on today's episode, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the Lions draft. Draft day coming up next Thursday. We'll break that down for you. A couple players to uh, to look at, to add to what we talked about last week as well. Also, some Michigan State basketball news. A couple of transfers in the mix, including one player that is just done. He's retiring from the game for good. We'll break that down for you because I thought that was really interesting hearing some of this stuff over the weekend. Also, Tiger Baseball, we do it every week, but I have a little bit of a different twist this week. It's not necessarily going to be what was on the field because what was on the field was horrendous, atrocious. Couldn't believe they got swept by the A's. But there's one particular story that I want to end on. And I want to end it on a really, really high note and just something positive to look forward to amidst a weekend of all kinds of negativities with uh, the Detroit Tigers. But I'm really looking forward to this show. Really excited to, uh, to join you guys. And it's been a real, real thrill for the past 40 plus episodes to be able to join you guys on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Also over the weekend, hopefully everybody had a great weekend out there, by the way. And uh, my football career is officially over. I, I never played football, of course. If you're just joining us, you know I, I've talked about it before. I, I am a filmer for the football team at John Carroll University, where I attend, uh, which is just outside of Cleveland. A lot of uh, great NFL personnel and coaches and, and general managers. London Fletcher, uh, one of the best linebackers uh, of the last decade, uh, two decades. So uh, it, it's definitely been a fun ride for me and uh, definitely uh, a job that has been very rewarding for me. And it, it's very behind the scenes. You know, of course, you're just you're just filming for players and coaches review during practice and games. It's a lot of early mornings and long nights, but it's over and it was a long, it was a, it was a tough, it was not a tough three years, I would say. It was mostly a very, very fun and enjoyable three years and, and getting to build a lot of relationships. And I know uh, my good buddy, Ben Mraz, uh, you know, he joined us over the summer on the podcast. Go check out his episode that I interviewed him for. He, uh, I got to meet him a lot through film. You know, we, we became really close through that, and he's a, 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 a relative of Don Shula, the uh, all-time winningest coach in John, in uh, NFL history, and he's also a John Carroll grad as well. 347. Let's hope Bill Belichick doesn't get to 347. I want to make sure Don Shula, uh, John Carroll grad, has that record over there, that's for sure. But it's it's been a great career and very, very happy that I was able to be a part of it. And a bittersweet, a little bit of a bittersweet weekend. That is for sure. All right, we want to get into some Lions talk. Last week, I had talked about, I had made a case that maybe, just maybe, and I hope nobody thinks I'm crazy out there, and it seems like I'm more sane now because more and more people are starting to agree with me. They're starting to uh, see see the bigger picture, if you will, that the Lions should draft Panay, Panay, Sewell, or Sewell, or or however you pronounce his name, the tackle, the left tackle from Oregon. And from what everything I've been reading, he is a very, very generational player, a a guy that could really, really make an impact in the NFL right away. And, you know, watching the tape, you know, great leverage. I mean, I mean, this guy, he's got great footwork. You know, he, he, he knows how to really manhandle people and he's physical and he's very violent. And I said last week, this sounds like somebody that Chris Spielman and Dan Campbell want. They want that tough guy. They want that tough guy on the line, you know, biting the kneecaps off. It sounds like it may be a pick that the Lions would like to have. So, but last week I had said, well, we're already pretty locked up at left tackle, and Sewell is a left tackle. He played left tackle throughout his whole career. And. I just, I was thinking, I was like, well, how would he adjust to the right side? Turns out he's been practicing on the right side of the line as well. He's been, he's been training on both sides. So basically, I think this is just a sign that says, I want to be more marketable to teams out there. So by practicing from the right side, you know, as well as his natural left side, he'll be able to, more teams will be interested in him because they'll, they can maybe see that, you know, hey, he's getting some reps on the right side and a lot of teams maybe already have that left tackle like the Lions do with Taylor Decker, why not just put him on the right side? And if, and this is only if, if Sewell 
falls to the Lions at seven, which I don't know if he will. You know, there might be five, six. Somebody might take him there. But if he does, I think the Lions can make a very, very strong case because the more and more I think about it, the more and more I think Kyle Pitts is going to go higher than seven. I really do. Because if you look at the draft right now, you see that, obviously, I mean, Trevor Lawrence, pretty much a lock to go to Jacksonville at number one. I mean, I, I, I think for sure that he's going there. I don't think there's really any debate about that. Then number two, you see mostly Zach Wilson, the quarterback from BYU, going to the Jets. Okay, that's fine. Best two quarterbacks, arguably the best two players in the draft off the board. That's fine. Then you start getting to three, four, five. That's when you start to see, okay, maybe Kyle Pitts could be in that mix. Maybe at number four with Atlanta, possibly. You know, and then there's the whole trade, there's the whole Niners situation. Would they take him there? Would they go quarterback at number three? Could they go Justin Fields, Mac Jones? One of those guys, by the way, stay away from Mac Jones. I'm, I am not a fan of Mac Jones. I would definitely take Justin Fields over Mac Jones if the Niners were at that position. That's just me. But uh, I, I think, I don't, I don't like, like I said, there's two, a lot of question marks about Justin Fields, but I think Mac Jones has more question marks. Than, than Justin Fields. But that's a whole nother talk for another day. You start to see, but you start to see with Pitts, possibly, you know, Atlanta at four, possibly at five with Cincinnati. Some some mock drafts have Jamar Chase, the wide receiver from LSU, who didn't even play last year. He opted out of the season, so he hasn't really played since the national championship with Joe Burrow. Some people say, hey, maybe he'll fall to number five to the Bengals, reunite himself with Joe Burrow, his you know, his college quarterback. Others say, you know, Pitts might fall to number five. Then you start getting to number six. You know, that's where some teams might be like, oh, well, you know, we're, we may take another wide receiver. You know, the, the Dolphins at six. We may take Devontae Smith or Jalen Waddle, one of those guys, you know, from Alabama. So, really, I mean, if you look at it, a lot of these mock drafts, and, and, and they, they kind of fluctuate because some people will, will say, well, well, Sewell, you know, he'll go – Towards the you know the top five somewhere in the middle of the top five or so, some place like that, and then there's others that even consider that Rayshon Slater from Northwestern could could be in that as well. But I don't know. I I see I see Slater going past the top ten at, le- at least in the mock the latest mock drafts I, I've really looked at. I mean, a couple of them have him going to like eleven to, to the New York the Giants, but I could see. I mean, according to some of these mock drafts, Sewell could be falling. All the way down to seven, eight range. Couple mock drafts I see with the Lions, they have them taking Justin Fields. No, 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 no. There, don't take a quarterback this year, please. If the Lions take a quarterback, oh, I, I, I don't know. I, I just because Jared Goff, we Jared Goff has not proven. He he hasn't proven anything yet. What if Jared Goff turns out to be, you know, really, really good for the Lions? I mean, you never know. They're obviously probably more inclined to stick with him. Then go with somebody else. So don't take. And this is this is what happens. Teams make mistakes by just taking a quarterback just because. I think the Jets did that with Sam Darnold. They took a quarterback. They didn't. I don't think they really wanted him necessarily, but they just took him just because. It was the same exact thing with Arizona and Josh Rosen a couple of years ago. It, J- Josh Rosen. Oh gosh. I mean, that's a whole other story there. I mean. You go in the top five and you're pretty much out of the league and, and out of a starting job in like two years. Wow. <sighs> Unbelievable. But anyways, you don't want the Lions to be stuck like that. You don't want them to just take a quarterback just because. Because then you're stuck with him and you have to pay him a lot of money because he's he's a first-round pick. And then there's going to be all kinds of expectations. So then he has to play. And then even though they already have a guy in Jared Goff who's been to a Super Bowl and who's put up decent numbers in a Rams, you know, a very, very lethal Rams passing attack. So I don't want to draft a quarterback. And I know our, our, our friend Dave Burkett, well, he's been on the podcast before, he wrote an article about the Lions possibly taking Davis Mills from Stanford. He played, yeah, he played for the Stanford Cardinal, like in the later rounds, maybe a day two, day three kind of prospect. And I, I just, I don't know. I, even if we don't draft a quarterback in the first round, I just, I stay away from a quarterback, please. I mean, look at the Lions. And, and, and look, 
I know it's not fair to judge the Lions' previous history with new management, with with guys that have never done this before. I, I, I understand. But however, if you look at the Lions' quarterbacks that they've taken in the last 10 years or so in the draft, a lot of it has just been, as our friend Matt Derry would say, a waste of time. You look at Brad Kaya. Anybody remember him from a couple years ago? They took him in the sixth round, and he basically washed out. I mean, he didn't even really make it past training camp. So just quarterbacks like that, I don't like when the Lions or whoever else will, will, will do that. I just don't want that to happen because it's just a waste of time. You, If you really, really want a quarterback for the future, you're going to have to take him in the first round. And you got to really, really believe that he is 100% your guy and you are 100% invested in him. And if the Lions aren't invested in one of these guys completely, why take him? Why? If you're invested in Kyle Pitts, in Sewell, in one of these other guys, and he falls to you, take him. Take him. At least you know about him. At least you're really, really committed and you 100% know that you know you're the guy that they want. Now, if he's going to pan out, that's a whole other story. But at least you're 100% committed. Don't be the Jets and just take a quarterback just because you need one. That's not what the Lions should do. And we're going to have to see next Thursday what happens. But no, do not pick. I do not think the Lions should go Davis Mills or any quarterback in the middle rounds just to see if he has starter potential. No. Because if you're picking a quarterback in the middle to late rounds, you're picking somebody that has maybe a, a good backup potential that maybe if the starter gets hurt or something, he could go in and. and and be fine, and, and play fine, and manage the game, and steer the ship when the ship goes down. That's what teams should do if they want to take a quarterback in the middle rounds. That's my opinion, uh, but I thought it was interesting that, that Dave Riquette had mentioned that. Uh, that is for sure. But next Thursday, the draft already is, and it's in Cleveland. I'm hoping to attend the draft and, and check it out. Hopefully, uh, in, a, in a podcast in a couple weeks from now, uh, I'll be able to recap uh, my my NFL draft experience. So um, that that'll be that'll be really exciting, and and I'm looking forward to it. Draft time is always special for me, and uh, it's really it's, I've been watching it for the past ten years on TV and just having a little get together at my house for it and. It's, it's always fun, and it, it brings a lot of people together. And the way that the NFL has made the draft over the last couple years has, has really made it special, especially when the draft has been moving from city to city. Uh, just, you know, like it's been gone from Chicago to Philadelphia, now Cleveland. You know, Dallas, I think, had it one year. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely unique. And uh, I, I like when it's at Radio City Music Hall, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's unique that it gets to travel to different cities. I would love... For Detroit to host it, you know, have it at the Fox Theater, maybe Hart Plaza, get a lot of people down there. That'd be really, really cool if uh, Detroit one day. But we got to start hosting Super Bowls and All Star Games first before we start hosting the the uh, the NFL Draft. That's for sure. All right, I have some Michigan State news for you, and I know they're out of season, and I know it might not be you know as relevant as some other news right now, but it is interesting because when I saw this, I thought for I just didn't understand it for a minute. And I got a little bit concerned. I'm not going to lie at first, but uh, looking back, I think I think I'll be okay. First of all, first things first. I wanted to get out of the way. Josh Langford, uh, he has decided to not continue playing basketball, so he and he's retiring from the game. Now, Josh Langford, interesting story, because this is a guy that came in as a highly touted recruit, part of the Fab Four, as I like to call them, recruiting class. Tom Izzo's recruiting class from 2016. And that was, of course, with Cash Swinston, U of D Jesuit alum, and Nick Ward, Miles Bridges, and him. And, you know, over the years, he really struggled with injuries. He had to have two surgeries on his foot, I believe, and he missed almost two years of action. And he was finally back this year as a, as a graduate student. But uh, he's he's graduated, he's done, and he, he could have probably played overseas. But, you know, he was just that emotional leader. He was, he was a real strong leader for Michigan State. And uh, I definitely, uh, I, I definitely wish him the best, if you will. Uh, and he, he seems to be at peace for not chasing a pro career. So uh, Chris Solari, the uh, the beat writer for Michigan State basketball, doing a really good job with some of those stories about him. But you know, for it's it's tough, especially when you are injured, and, and you know the the whole rehab process, and keep getting injured and over and over again. You know that could take a, a real toll on you. I mean, look at Andrew Luck. I mean, Andrew Luck was. 
you know, you, he could just tell he was interested in other things besides football. And on top of that, he had really, really struggled with with injury. So uh, Josh Langford, you know, he, he seems to be really doing well and he seems to be happy with his decision. So thank you for the memories, Josh. You know, there was a lot of a lot of good ones there with with Cassius and all them and that amazing recruiting class. And uh, we uh, we here at the Detroit Sports Podcast Network wish a, a, a very great Spartan in Josh Langford the best of luck moving forward. So just wanted to get that out of the way. But also some all, some interesting news with Michigan State. They're, they're starting to get a lot of guys transferring out. So Thomas Kithier has moved on as well as Foster Lawyer, among others. Now, about Foster Lawyer and Thomas Kithier, I really wonder if – them transferring, both of them transferring, has anything to do with Fife leaving. Of course, Dane Fife, the uh, longtime assistant coach for Tom Izzo, and he took an assistant job uh, with the new head coach at the University of Indiana, or Indiana University, excuse me. So uh, Thomas Kithier, you know, he had played three years at Dakota in Macomb, and then there was that whole debate with the MHSAA. It, it made a lot of news. I mean, I think it even trickled into the national news that he could not play his senior year at because uh, he had transferred to Clarkston uh, to play with Foster Lawyer and all them. But then the, there was the whole debate about, you know, the, he was there because he wanted to go into sports and they had a sports management class and, and, and all that. But really, I mean, I think the writing was on the wall that he pretty much was there to play basketball, but he couldn't even play basketball his senior year. So he had to wait until, you know, freshman year at Michigan State in order to, you know, play play in, in competition. But his teammate in high school, Foster Lawyer at Clarkston, I mean, he was, you know, Mr. Basketball, very, very good player. I mean, he could score. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's a high school legend in the state of Michigan. However, the, the thing was is that, and it's the problem for both of them, is that they just did not seem to be, like, Power 5 Big Ten players. I think they were maybe mainly lower-tier Division One guys at best, Maybe even, I mean, you, you look at, you, you go into the, like D2 maybe, maybe those types of players, I mean, they would probably thrive on a D2 team, but I would say lower tier Division One at best. I believe Kithier is transferring to Valparaiso, so that was a team that was formerly in the Horizon League with UD Mercy in, in Oakland and all them, but they're now in the Missouri Valley Conference with teams like Loyola, Bradley, Drake, all that. So I personally, I think... That was the best decision for Kithier. There were there were times during games I was just like, why why are they starting him? And then he just you know kind of comes in for a little bit and doesn't do a whole lot and then comes out. That was just me. I just never understood why Izzo started him and played him in, in in decent minutes. I just never thought Thomas Kithier was anything special. So I think he'll do better off at a, at another university. But it just didn't seem like it worked out in Michigan State for him, at least on the court. Uh, that's for sure. Foster is another interesting thing because, you know, obviously, you know, he got hurt last year. And y- you just kind of knew from the start he was never going to be Cassius. You know, and, and you know, just ha- having to replace a guy of Cassius's caliber, you know, that's that's tough. That's that's really, really hard. And, you know, that's a lot of pressure on Foster. And, you know, I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm, Foster was, was a great teammate. You know, he was really supportive of Cassius. Cassius really mentored him and everything. But it just didn't work out. You know, and I just knew he just Foster just never had that pizzazz like Cassius did. You know, especially passing the ball and all that. This this was a guy that just was a very, very good high school player, but just really, really short. And I don't think he really had the height for, you know, Big Ten basketball. There were times, oh my gosh, I remember about Foster. There were times that he would be guarding somebody in the post and I'm thinking, I'm like, why would 5'9", five, 5'10", five, whatever he was, point guard, be uh, be guarding somebody in the post, like a big man in the post? I just, there were some mismatches there that were just so obvious, and I'm just, he, he seemed to be a little bit of a liability defensively. Uh, that, that That's what I'll say. So uh, he's he's out, and so is Kithier. And Rocket Watts, too. I'm, I'm curious to see where Rocket goes, because I think Rocket is talented. I just don't think he is like a point guard. That's not his that's not his natural position. His natural position is more of a shooting guard. But another guy that lit it up in high school that seems to have struggled with the transition at Michigan State, you know, to big time Big 10 if you will. So, I'm curious. I would love to see because like I said, I just think that if if he goes to a team that they really really get the most out of him, I think 
I think he could thrive. So we'll have, we'll have to see what happens. But Michigan State, though, they're getting a couple of transfers, though, in. A lot of guys, it, it, just remember, folks, there's a lot of players transferring all over the place. So it, it, I just find it interesting that a lot of them are coming from Michigan State. You know, you'd think that a lot of them would be staying and all that, but it seems like Marcus Bingham and Gabe Brown are really the only guys left. You know, from from that uh, that the, like a senior class, if you will, because Aaron Henry already declared, and then Foster and Kithier, among others, have transferred. So, I it's it's interesting, and it's something to keep an eye on. But just remember, there are a lot of teams that uh, are, are getting transfers left and right, including Michigan State. This kid Tyson Walker, he is projected to be the starting point guard for next season, and he's a transfer from Northeastern. By the way, shout out to Greg Eboig Bodine. He is a U of D Jesuit alum, my class of 2017. And uh, he played at Illinois his freshman year, and then he transferred to Northeastern. So Tyson Walker is a teammate of Greg Eboig Bodine's, or was, I should say. So he transferred to um, Michigan State. And this is a guy that averaged uh, just under 19 points a game and five assists at Northeastern. And he was also the colonial Athletic Association's Defensive Player of the Year. Now, lower tier Division One. Obviously, his stats are probably going to be a little bit inflated, and he's going to have to start right away, probably at Michigan State. As of now, now you know, obviously anything could change, but this this is interesting here because obviously, you know, if he wins the Defensive Player of the Year in his conference, you know, he's got to be a great defensive player. And, and Izzo, you know, he preaches defense a lot. You know, you see the guys slapping the floor and, and, all, and all that. So he could provide a spark. Obviously, the one thing I'm curious about is how is he going to adjust to the very, very competitive Big Ten? Obviously, I, I think the best conference in uh, the NCAA Division One. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting. And will can he handle the pressure of of starting? And uh, I wonder why he chose Michigan State. I really do. I really, really do. I, he may have had some ties to Izzo, maybe in high school or somebody from there. But this could be uh, this could be a guy that that really pays dividends for Michigan State. But we'll have to see. But just something to something of note with some of the the transfer portals uh, with Michigan State basketball. And I know we're a long, long way from the season. You know, we still have the summer and they, you know, they this, and all that the summer workouts and, and whatnot. But as of now, it, it seems like this. Uh, this former Northeastern Husky Tyson Walker uh, will be the new point guard for Michigan State. All right, folks, wanted to end on a very, very high note. And I know there's so much negativity with Detroit sports these days. You know, you, you think left and right about how bad these teams are. You talk about how bad the Pistons are, how bad the Red Wings are, you know, the Lions. They can never seem to get it right. The Tigers, blah, blah, blah. And I know we've talked a lot about the Tigers the last couple weeks. Um, they oh gosh I mean eight to four three to zero seven zero and they lose three to two and a walk off in the ninth on Sunday I mean nothing seemed to go right for them this past weekend in Oakland in the thick air of Oakland as uh, Tony La Russa would say now the manager for the White Sox Hall of Fame manager by the way they're gonna play the Pirates this week at home and then the Royals so maybe maybe haven't maybe coming home will help uh, from the long and tiring uh, West Coast road trip. Who knows? But anyways, so I, I don't really want to talk about the games. It was just, it was bad. And uh, the, the Tigers' record isn't, uh, it's not the best right now. But they could rebound, obviously, against the the Pirates and the Royals. But one in particular, and this, go, this, this is from up in the broadcast booth. Great story I read over the weekend on Freep.com, and it's been all over Detroit News as well. Dan Hasty getting a call up of the lifetime uh, to replace uh, Dan Dickerson in the radio booth for a game, and now look, this is this is incredible because Dan Hasty is a very very good voice for the West Michigan Whitecaps, so the single A affiliate of your Detroit Tigers, and I've had the chance to meet Dan before. I've had a phone interview with him, and let's just say he's a very very classy guy, and he he he's awesome to talk to. And the fact that he got called up this weekend is is amazing because, you know, especially in the broadcast industry, especially in baseball, you know, there's a lot of guys out there that are really trying to make it. You know, they're really they, they've been make, they've been trying their whole lives, you know, in college, you know, getting a lot of demo tape done and, and then trying to work their ways up in the in the rankings in, in baseball. And you know, we talk about players being called up all the time in, in major leagues. 
broadcasters can be called up too. Apparently, Matt Shepard was sick, and he couldn't call the game on TV. So they slid Dan Dickerson over to the TV booth, and there was an opening for radio. So they called up Dan Hasty and asked, you know, hey, do you want to, you know, it's your time to shine. You know, so, uh, but that was a really exciting story to hear that about Dan Hasty. And, uh, you know, for somebody like me who really wants to go into the broadcast industry and uh, and looking for jobs and looking for internships, all that, it's uh, it's really, really good to hear stories like that, that, you know, no matter how hard you try, uh, you're always, you, you know, you never know what's going to happen. All that hard work is going to pay off. And uh, it definitely did for Dan Hasty, that's for sure. Even if it's just for one game, you know, being able to fill in, being able to be adjustable and flexible and all that is is really is really critical and uh, really happy for for Dan Hasty. Maybe one day we'll get him on the podcast. Uh, he was definitely he was. I'll, I'll admit he was one of the guests that I, I had in mind over the last couple months to have on. But uh, apologize, uh, especially for the last couple months. It's just been a little hard for me to have some guests on. But hopefully, when uh, the sports over here start to die down, and maybe I'll be able to. Uh, we'll see what happens in the summer. But uh, maybe, maybe we'll start to have some a little bit more guests on. Uh, so hopefully hopefully that'll happen. And congrats to Dan Hasty because getting that call up is is something very very special and it's just it's just like a player getting called up. you know you go back to your childhood of, of your your dreams and all that. the West Michigan Whitecaps he's also a 2008 grad of CMU so he's a he's a Chippewa. So really happy for Dan Hasty and he he's one of his big influences was uh, Dan Hasty or excuse me it was Ernie Harwell. And uh, from the article, I'll, 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 you know what? I won't ruin this article for you guys. I'll let you go check it out, Freep.com, and uh, with Evan Petzold. He is the beat writer for the Tigers on the, on there, He and he talked about it. There was a letter that Ernie Harwell had written to uh, to Dan Hasty back in the day, and it's uh, really special. So the fact that he has those influences uh, in his life and his broadcast career is, uh, is awesome and really, really happy and that he was able to um, to get his call up. And it's just a great story. Thought about ending the week on a, on a very, very high note because the Tigers have not really been on a high note lately. And uh, it's just something really cool to, to talk about and share here on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. But thanks again, folks, for tuning in. As always, make sure to check out all the other content that the network has to offer. Doc and Jock, the Wrestling Podcast, the Michigan Podcast, all have it for you. Also, SI Lions, uh, John Macaroon does a great job covering the team, and he's be, he's been in a lot of the press conferences asking questions and all that. So he's definitely has an inside scoop on everything Lions-related, and there's going to be a lot of draft coverage as well in the next couple of weeks. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. But until next time, folks, you're listening to Open Mic Night.